psychosocial needs in relation to um, our role, our purpose, our identity, our social status. Um, but it's also a major driver of um, social gradients in health. So it's always just worth, you know, I think revisiting those core principles about, about why being in work is good for your health. Okay, next one. Um, so work can impact on health in many different ways. So um, looking at working conditions, you know, the physical, chemical, ergonomic hazards in the workplace. Um, and the fact that they can result in a, in a range of diseases or injuries, you know, so the actual working conditions and how important those are, but also the psychosocial working environment, you know, how work is organised, what the um, culture of the organisation you work for is, do their values align with yours, what are their attitudes, what's the organisation's beliefs, practices, you know, what do they demonstrate on um, in terms of you know how that organisation operates, and all of that affects our both our mental and our physical well-being, and it can cause um, emotional or mental stress. And on the flip side, it can also uh, contribute to well-being, to good, positive well-being. Um, just to highlight, you know, a quick look here at the demand control model, which you may well have seen before, um, and. Uh, Stephen Bevan highlighted earlier in his presentation, he talked about the Whitehall study. Um, stress is caused in jobs with high employer demands combined with control over their work, as this limits control while generating continued pressure. Um, and high demand com combined with low control is associated with high risks of fatal or non-fatal cardiovascular events, as, as Stephen highlighted earlier. Thank you. Um, so what impact do working conditions have on health? We just wanted to draw on a few bits of research, um, you know, in, in this respect, in terms of looking at maybe some surprising elements here, but the most consistent predictors of back pain, um, according to, to one study, um, were decision control, empowering leadership and fair leadership. So I think that's really interesting in terms of it's not just about the mental health impact, it's also about the the physical health impact and the symbiotic relationship between physical and mental health. Um, workers whose job in the last 12 months prevented them from, from giving the time they wanted to their family had, had a lower probability of reporting good health and a higher probability of reporting fair and bad health. So again, you know, the impact on health of um, those Sort of markers of, of job quality, either poor job quality or good job quality. Workers from households with a total monthly income um, enabling an end to be met um, have a higher probability of good self-assessed health and a lower probability of being of being sick. So you know, really important relationship there between you know the stresses um, of being in perhaps lower paid work not being able to make ends meet and a greater proportion of those in lower occupational cause psychosocial um, working conditions as as we highlighted earlier so just some references um, at the bottom uh, if you want to look up any of that and get a bit more detail the characteristics of healthy workplaces tend, tend to be around organisational buy-in um, to health and well-being. So the presence or absence of organisational support at a senior level is a really important success factor. And there's loads of research evidence um, which supports that statement. Um, financial commitment, there needs to be sufficient resources, materials and equipment, but also capacity, you know, the people. It's important that, you know, managers are freed up to do this job properly around health and well-being of their staff. Um, managerial support, um, as I've just said, key mechanism for successful impl implementation of workplace health interventions. Communication and engagement, another key characteristic. Um, organisations can support workplace health um, by using existing channels of communication, but we've also seen through the pandemic, lots of organisations have introduced um, new uh, channels of communication and understand, understood the need to address some of the adaptation uh, as a result of the pandemic. Um, and then policy integration, basically being workplace health being integrated into, into everything 
all the policies across the organisation, um, health and well-being as an underpinning principle around um, everything that an organisation does um, in relation to its its staff and um, the example it perhaps sets in the wider community. So that research article at the bottom there, Brunton, um, highlights um, um, effective interventions in relation to workplace health and goes into a lot more detail. And then finally, um, just a model um, from the Centre for Disease, Contr Disease Control in the US. Um, I've included this just because it's a really good way of, of showing, I suppose, the breadth of um, what contributes to workplace health and well-being, including those individual demographic health risk, you know, and behaviours type type issues, um, the practices and work environment and and infrastructure at an organisational level, uh, and the wider community um, in terms of where where an employer an organisation sits in the wider community and what those what influence that has on how an organisation can operate. Then the, the planning and management element, the leadership support, the management, having a, a, an improvement plan around workplace health. You know, there's always something that can be done and that can be improved, not stopping um, when you reach a certain point. Uh, dedicated resources I've already talked about and communications. And then implementing, um, so programs, you know, education, this mentions counselling, policies, um, you know, health and wellbeing policies, but also wider set of policies, um, pay and benefits, sort of key key part of all of this, and the kind of um, you know access to services, access you know referral signposting to to help when it's needed, or just to information and guidance and toolkits and that kind of thing. Um, and then the evaluation part of it in terms of how do we know um, we, you know, that, that these approaches are making a difference. And these are all aspects that form part of our Healthy Working Wales uh, programme and the work we do with employers are very much kind of based around these, these core principles. So the workshop session, um, you know, we, we've got three activities there for you. They're all interrelated um, so hopefully you'll have time to kind of get into a bit of discussion but the first one's around recognizing we have a good policy environment in Wales to promote and support workplace health and well-being but there's still actually a long way to go so what are the barriers and enablers what are the levers for employers on the ground around implementing health and well-being practices and a better um, a healthier environment so you'll have 15 minutes to discuss that. And I should say we've got, um, hopefully, I, I can't see how many tables we've got at the moment of, of individuals, but we've got five um, facilitators who are Healthy Working Wales team members. Um, and they're going to be hopefully on, on each of the tables to facilitate and also to time, keep you to time and then feedback at the end to, to our sort of joint session at the end. The second activity is around practical support or resources. What, what do employers need to create a work envir environment that promotes health and well-being? And then the final activity is around drawing on those two discussions. What are the, the top six things so three from each of those discussions that, that you think would make a real difference to promote health at work and those are the, the six things we want you to feedback at the end and that will form part of our feedback to the plenary session at the very end of the conference so i'm now going to um come off this so that you can kind of get going with your your table chat the time is um now seven minutes uh past one so we may um get a little bit of extra time i'll work that out and I'll, I'll be putting some reminders about timings in the general chat for the whole workshop so keep an eye on those um and i'll see you back here at the end to to get your feedback thanks hopefully you had a um good discussion in your in your tables um, so just to let you know, we're going to spend the next sort of 10 minutes um, receiving feedback from each of the tables um, and then hopefully leave just a few minutes before, because I believe the plenary, the final plenary session, everyone's joining us in this workshop space for the final plenary. So we'll just uh, try and finish a couple of minutes early um, so we can be ready. Right. So let's hear some feedback on your, um, you know, six uh, ideas.
um, about what what employers can a- actually do and um, what you know what are the enablers and barriers. Um, from um, let's go for table one. So that's that's Bev or Deanna, I believe, is feeding back. But if you just need to turn your mic. Deanna's feeding back. Sorry. And you can put your camera on too, if you wish. <laughs> De- Deanna's got the notes, so Deanna's feeding back. So Deanna, can you put your mic and camera on? We'll get there. <laughs> no sign of, oh, here we are. Oh, Bev's back. Diana's just texted me to say she can't get on. So maybe move on to another group. Yeah. Got Claire now. Hi, I, I can go if you want. Is that okay? Should I go first? Yeah, go for it, Claire. Okay, great. So we had some really, really good discussions. It was really quite difficult to pull out kind of three key themes for each of the work groups. So um, I hope I've done I've done it justice, and anybody's welcome to put in the chat if I'm presenting any information incorrectly. Okay, so our top things then. So for activity one, so we said that. Um, there were sometimes unrealistic expectations on um, occupational health and the amount of, well, the limited amount of resource that we ha- that businesses had, uh, you know, across Wales, so that we felt that there needed to be adequate training in occupational health, so that there was a skilled workforce across the field, and that there needed to be more links with primary care, and if at all possible, that occupational health should be mainstreamed into primary care. Um, and that there would be a proactive provision within a primary care settings which would pick up these issues and stop people from falling out of work be- before they actually you know actually mm. do and have a huge detrimental impact on the, on their life going forward so that's what we f- we felt there needed to be more training there needed to be links with other physicians gps <coughs> nursing profession professions because it was a specialist field um, so that that was our key barrier that we felt there needed to be more provision there within uh, occupational health. In terms of an enabler, we felt that going down the route of the Social Values Act would be a really good one, and and we felt particularly for young people because they're really into to you know these acts and they can see the benefits that would have for them, for their future, and for the communities. So going around the lines of how good employers can not only have an impact on their workforce but wider than that on the community and on on and on young people and and how we felt that there'd be really good buy-in and it would be really good acknowledgement from um the clients customers communities for that employer and then finally we felt that a, a lever would be around around procurement and that health and well-being being embedded into contracts for any for any business that tenders for works with the Welsh Government or with the large local authorities, the health boards, any anchor businesses in Wales, where they would have to demonstrate that their work is in keeping with the principles of good work. And we felt that that would then allow for the, the good work principles to filter through the systems in Wales and would put more of an emphasis on well-being um, for these, these smaller companies as well. So those are our top three for activity one. Activity two. So I think we all acknowledge that the support and resources we that people would need and that shouting out for really is a dedicated health and wellbeing resource. And for the larger businesses that are lucky to have a dedicated member of staff or a team, you know, some have a big team and then others see it as an add on to an already hectic job role. So I think the key thing that people were asking for was further investment from the government to create wellbeing posts either dedicated to that business or well-being support that they could allocate a certain amount of time to these businesses who are you know lacking this capacity 
um, resources and tools people felt were, were needed on you know a range of topics and to be able to access these to use within the workplace um, would be really useful but we felt that these needed to be simple easy to understand and easy to implement and roll out as well and then finally we felt that it was really important and you know what covid has, has taught us is that you know we can't stay still we need to keep ourselves on top of the key challenges and issues that are affecting our workforce and therefore if we were if we were able to provide businesses with sources of information on kind of what those key issues are and key resources to help support those businesses that would keep them um, or enable them to look after the health and well-being of their workforce more efficiently so that's it for me hope that brilliant okay. thanks thanks claire that's brilliant quick run through that with some really good issues coming up there that's great okay we're going to go to um Table three, which I think is Ellie, Eleanor, um, Messam, just so that um, Jamie knows to bring her in. Brilliant. Hi, Ellie. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, it's like the Euro Eurovision Song Contest, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Go for it. Nail point. No. <laughs> so um, in our uh, discussion, again, we had lots that came up um, and we picked out the three, but they're not in a particular order. Um, so looking at the policies and actions, we said uh, to have a systematic evaluation approach, a benchmarking of, of what good looks like, sharing, being able to share good practice, that um, we discussed that there are too many businesses, especially small businesses, working in silos and there's not enough cooperation and networking and sharing of resources, which is kind of echoing what Claire's just said. Um, our, our second point is about exec and manager level modelling and that um, behaviours, especially from those high up um, in the organisation, are really important. And if they're not showing the right example to, to staff who are working for them, then that can really damage um, good practices and good work um, for those beneath them. And then we also said about being a, a listening organisation and being adaptable um, because all businesses are so different. We talked about small organisations, they might not struggle so much with being able to engage with each other, potentially, maybe not now working from home, but um, in bigger organisations to try and shift a culture or a way of working um, is, can be a bigger challenge. We, we mentioned your staff having little children and their work-life balance, but then you also might have other staff who are socially isolated. So trying to adapt to the different needs um, of your staff and that being a, a listening organisation would help with that. And then on the second activity, um, we mentioned engagement. And we talked about that in the first activity as well, that businesses might score highly but actually they're engaging at a level that works for them and, and for the high up in an organisation to score well. But actually, if you dig down into it, staff might not feel like they're being listened to and, and the engagement might not be right for them. Um, and also a, an acknowledgement that businesses might not know how to engage, that just because you've started up a business might not mean that you've got management skills. So what what is good engagement? Is it a meeting a week? Are there can there be benchmarking and sharing of, of good practice? And we know good engagement is a legal duty, but what does that actually look like? And is there, what supports do we have? Can the in-work support schemes that we've got be expanded to, in, to include this within them? And our second point was on evaluation. How do we show that improvements are being made? You can lose trust in staff if you're asking them the same questions and you're not actually changing anything from it. So being able to evaluate what you've done um, and also not necessarily having the evidence to prove that looking after staff does make a difference. So having that benchmark and something to measure um, would be helpful. And then our final thing was having an Im implementation plan with milestones to show how progress is being made. So something tangible that you can work through um, as employers to be able to help your staff. And that's it from us. 
That's great. Um, and then just finally, I think we've only got a couple of minutes before we need to kind of um, bring this to a close. Um, Deanna sent through the um, notes from the other table where we haven't been able to hear back from them directly. Um, I'm just trying to think. So um, from the first activity, I'll just read out their kind of key words um, just for info. So culture and attitude as ba you know barriers, political barriers, and the impact of interventions. So not understanding or knowing the impact of interventions. Um, enablers, Healthy Working Wales was highlighted as one of those in terms of working with employers to, to, to address some of these issues. And also the living wage. Um, activity two, um, key words again. So communication is key, organizational buy-in, uh, signposting um, to resources, to services, etc., um, and so access to kind of local, you know, resources that are kind of right um, for that for that um, geographic area um, of of those localities. Um, and activity three, uh, yeah, political will uh, was number one. Um, this is not, these are nice notes, nice and brief. Um, minimum income for healthy living was the second one from activity one. Improving collaboration, so that so we're talking about employers, communities, and services. So collaboration between all of those parties, um, and then activity two, organisational buy-in, one-stop shop for signposting, and effective management and the supports. Um, you know, supports to managers really to be able to effectively manage. So echoing some of what was said elsewhere. So sorry, that one was a bit of a whistle stop tour, but we have got longer notes here that Public Health Network Cymru will be writing up from all the workshops and those will be shared in due course. So um, thank you to everybody um, for your participation in the workshop. Um, actually, some fantastic stuff came through there, really valuable. And, um, you know, we, we can take account of that within Healthy Working Wales, but also share that with other policymakers, influencers, you know, local services, whatever it might be, so that we can work together to, to make a difference to um, the workforce of Wales health and wellbeing. So thank you for joining. And um, Hang on in here because I, I think, yeah, don't go anywhere because the plenary session will be uh, starting in a minute. And Claire, uh, Claire from my team is going to be providing the plenary feedback um, rather than me. So you get to hear a different voice. Okay, thanks. Bye.